I think lectures like this are really important because it's important to mark things like 100 years since the representation of the People Act, but also because it gives us a chance to reflect on where we are and what the progress has been over those 100 years, and also to reflect on the situation uh, as we find it. Because, as all of you all know, the current situation worldwide isn't really great, and there's a great history of economic recessions being followed by populist leaders who seek to make incursions on our hard-won liberties and legal landmarks like this representation of the People Act. So whether it's Duterte in the Philippines with his extrajudicial killings or Xi Jinping in his persecution of the Uyghur minority in China, albeit Putin, Erdogan, Bolsonaro in Brazil or Trump in the United States, it's fair to say that the current global situation isn't really that promising. So I, I'm really glad that we've got such an articulate advocate here this evening to give the speech that she's going to give, but also to give us that platform so we can reflect on how far we've come, but how far there is still to go and how we need to push back against that global development that I've just spoken of. Now, I just want to talk for a little bit about a few instances from my professional life. I'm, I'm like Shami, I'm a barrister. Um, and a lot of the things that I've experienced in my professional life are really supported by what Shami writes about in her book and really emphasised to me the importance of what we're going to talk about tonight. Because as Shami talks about in her fantastic book, which I recommend that you do acquire... <laughs> I, I, I'm not on commission on this either from the excellent booksellers outside or elsewhere. <laughs> what Shami talks about is the imbalance in the judiciary. Now, I know from my experience going to court that over two-thirds of our judiciary are male, and they're not just male, they're males from a certain persuasion. Now, many of you will know in our country, a lot of the laws are not only made by parliament, but made by judges who sit in court through our common law system. And so we're lumbered with a body of law from those courts, which is very male in its orientation. Now, I've raised that with high court judges in informal settings and with senior figures in the bar. And they all say to me, oh, the problem's further down the chain. You know, it takes a long time, old boy. You know, time, change will come. <laughs> but, but the reality is, we know 100 years on from the representation of the People Act, that change doesn't just come about like that. And it comes about through the measures that Shami talks about in her book, because when things aren't changing naturally, we do have to have more interventionist measures to, I think, have quotas for judges so that we can make sure that we have a common law that's formed by an equal share of men and women. I've also had other experience from my other, my very brief and unsuccessful professional life as, as a rugby player. <laughs> Spectacularly unsuccessful. But it gives me an interest in sport and You'll all know that this sport, this university, is probably the most successful sporting university in the world. Some of you may also know that it has a women's rugby team which has professional players called the Loughborough Lightning. Did you know that? They're currently top of the league, top of the National League. But when I log on to the BBC Rugby website, can I find their results? No. I can find tiers one to four of the male league and tiers one to three of the Scottish leagues but I can't find those results on the BBC Sport website. Now, at conference last year, I went up to the BBC stand and I said, well, you spend many times more pounds on men's sport than you do women's sport, and you are the public service broadcaster. And the response I got was, but we do have a duty to entertain, you know. <laughs> A duty to entertain. Now, Shami picks up the BBC in her book, and, amongst some other, well, many other issues. And she says that you know, their charter ought to be amended, such as promote equality. And I'd love that to be a duty to spend as much on women's sport as on men's sport. Because let's be honest, that men's sport's going to find it, its way to the telly, come what may. But really, we need to think about these pretty straightforward, logical measures to redress years of inaction. So they're my, that's my tuppence. Him come to listen to me, he comes to listen to Shami. Um, now, I was at university 2003 to 2006. So that was the kind of... <laughs> oh, I know. 
sorry, Shami. It was a kind of... <laughs> That, that was a segue. We're in a university. I thought I'd mention university. It was the height of the war on terror. Many of you will remember that. And a lot of our politicians, from many different political persuasions, took that as an excuse to make incursions on our civil liberties. And you'll remember that Shami, at that time, was the leading voice in the country for, for liberty, both literally and figuratively. And I'm delighted she's here tonight to be a voice on equality. Um, and it's a real honour to be able to introduce her. So, without further Adieu. I'll, I'll introduce Shami Chakrabarti, our Shadow Attorney General. Well, thank you. Thanks for that wonderful welcome and thank you, Stuart. I could have listened to you carry on, actually. Um, it's actually quite a serious point there that... Um, that, that feminism is about men and women working together for, for, for change. And um, I really look forward to uh, seeing you uh, pursue that cause um, in the Palace of Westminster before too, before too long. I think you'll make a, a, real, a real difference. Um, so be afraid, be very afraid. Um, but we've heard about, a bit about the BBC, but that other great organ of, um, of our media, the Sun newspaper, um, <laughs> Um, organ um, <laughs> of our media um, once called me the most dangerous woman in Britain. <laughs> um, thank, actually, and you can imagine that was the making of me, right? <laughs> and so I, I was director of Liberty at, at the time, as you heard, and I would, I would trot around the country speaking to different audiences about their rights and freedoms and how they were under threat and couldn't be taken for granted. And uh, you'd, you'd open every time with, be afraid, be very afraid. The Sun newspaper once called me the most dangerous woman in Britain. And you could tell a lot about an audience by their reaction to, to that opening statement. You know, some, some parts of the country, I won't tell you where, there was a bit of nervous, anxious laughter. <laughs> um, and of course, in other other parts of the country are a warmer welcome like yours. And the closer you got to the great city of Liverpool, the greater the prospect of a standing ovation <laughs> before you'd even begun. But, but the serious point about being back here in Loughborough is that, um, I don't know if you, some of you might remember, others probably, most of you probably not. I was, um, as a young director of Liberty, a youngish director of Liberty in 2005, at the height of the war, on terror, this university gave me an honorary doctorate, right? Now, um, honorary doctorates are an interesting thing and, and, and I, I'm sure there are all sorts of reasons for them. I don't have as many as, as, as David Beckham, I'm sure. <laughs> but, and, uh, you know, one wants to, you know, make little self-effacing jokes. I sometimes call them plastic PhDs. I, I don't have a real one. but. What that particular honorary doctorate meant to me at that time, that difficult time, sticking up for, sticking up for civil liberties at the height of the, of the war on terror, that, for me, was an act of solidarity um, that I've never forgotten. So, um, so thank you, those of you who were involved and those of you in the uh, university institution here that, that were, were involved in that. But it's, um, it, it means a lot to me, and it's great to be back um, with this wonderful... Uh, socialist feminist candidate who I hope <laughs> will, be, will, will be your next member of parliament. Um, I'm here, as, as we've heard, to talk about gender injustice. Um, and I'm going to use as a, as a, bit, of a, a bit of a crib sheet uh, my book that, that, that we plugged, that Stuart very kindly um, plugged earlier. And it's called Of Women in the 21st Century. And I, I, I wrote it um, with a view to the centenary this year. And um, I wrote it, I suppose, for, for three reasons. Um, the first was personal. Um, my mother died very suddenly in 2011. Uh, prematurely, I thought, six, 69 years old. Uh, didn't, you know, these days that's, quite, these days that's quite, quite young in this country. And uh, it was a moment of real reflection, as I think the loss of a parent always is, and, and, and there's a special type of loss when it's, when it's the, the parent of your own sex. 
and you feel the t that you're at the top of the escalator now, and it, yeah, and, you, and it makes you reflect on on the life that your mother had, and on the uh, you know the hard times and the struggles, what she did for me. In her case, she taught me to read and write before I went to school. Um, it's a sadness that she never got to read one of my books, but but this one is very much dedicated to her because I think we, we owe so much to her generation of women, but we also owe, um, owe a duty to the women yet to come and, um, and to, our, to our daughters and sons. So that was a sort of personal motivation. And also, you know, as, as Stuart very gallantly pointed out, I'm not so young anymore. <laughs> and, um, and, um, and so, you know, I, I want to speed up change. I haven't got forever anymore in the way that I did 20 years ago and was listening to people say, oh, no, no, it's lower down the food chain, old chap. And, um, the other argument is meritocracy. Yeah? Like the status quo in the world or in this country or anywhere is meritocratic. Yeah? Oh, you don't want to be a token, do you? You wouldn't want to get a job. Just, you wouldn't want to get a job just because you're a woman. Well... You know, did these chaps worry about getting jobs for all these centuries? Because them? anyway, you, you take my point. So that's a sort of personal, um, sort of grumpy middle-aged woman motivation for writing a book of this kind. The, um, the, 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 the second um, prompt was that um, having left Liberty, uh, a cross-party, non-party political campaigning organisation, and a domestically focused one, I now had the opportunity to tackle this subject, which I don't think, in my view, can be adequately tackled without getting quite political, to be honest with you, and without getting quite international. Because for me, at least, um, the injustice we're discussing is not just a civil and political discrimination, it is social and economic and structural, and it affects every aspect of life, and it's very, very political. Um, it's not just a little nice NGO issue. You can, you can make some campaigns like let's have the vote and, you know, but, but there's so much more. For example, austerity is a huge feminist issue in this country at this time, just as one example, right? So I was free, if, I was liberated from liberty, if you like, and I could now talk about my feminism in the only way that I um, know how, which is holistically. Um, and... and I don't know, the third, what was the, what was the third reason? I forgot the third reason. That's the trouble with, th with, with three-part lists. But, um, <laughs> but the, yeah, the third reason was the politics, like the political moment. Because as Stuart said, this is a radical, polarised political moment. It's quite a scary political moment in many ways in Britain, today of all days, in Europe and all over the world. And do you know what? It's Donald Trump that wants to build a wall. It's not me. I've never been someone, you know, despite my reputation, I, I'm, I'm not someone who likes to um, pick fights and make trouble. Trouble just seems to find me. Um, but I knew that in this radical moment, I, I, I knew which side I was on, right? It's not, uh, it's, not, it's not Mr. Trump, it's Mr. Corbyn. But equally, I wanted to make sure that the woman's cause did not get forgotten about or left behind. That it was going to be completely mainstreamed in this, in this Labour programme at this crucial time. Um, and that a radical Labour government will also be um, a very feminist Labour government. So those are, those are the sort of three motivations. For... And I think, I think I can best introduce the argument... If, if, you, if you'll indulge me with reading a few paragraphs from the, from the introduction to, to, to the book that might just set it up a little bit for you. The 2017 elections in the ne Netherlands, France and the UK provide some significant reason for hope. All three ballots saw an ultimate rejection of the hard-right xenophobia of the PVV, Front National and UKIP. <coughs> The British Labour Party, led by Jeremy Corbyn, confounded the cynicism of its critics and forced an overconfident right-wing conservative leadership into minority government. It took women's representation in the House of Commons to its highest ever proportion, if still only 32%. 
It delivered a 50% female shadow cabinet with Emily Thornbury, Diane Abbott, Nia Griffiths and Rebecca Long Bailey holding the traditional male bastion briefs of foreign and home affairs, defence and business. Just as important was the positive nature of both the substance and tone of the Labour campaign against austerity and inequality, standing in sharp contrast with the smears, character attacks and dog whistles from the right. However, the hung parliament outcome of the election left the Conservatives limping on in office, if not quite in power propped up this time by the Northern Irish Democratic Unionist Party with its reactionary position on women's reproductive rights in particular. The new spotlight on socially conservative forces in UK politics serves as a reminder that no creed or country has a monopoly of virtue as far as the place of women is concerned. Imagine a Martian falls to earth tonight. You've got to work with me now, right? <laughs> Let's say Martians are sexless and completely unaccustomed to sexual or gender-based difference on their own planet. Our alien friend could arrive absolutely anywhere in our world, on any continent, in a rich, poor, urban or rural environment. What difference discrimination or oppression would they notice everywhere and most of all. Surely they couldn't fail to observe that roughly half the race is overtly diminished in a way that diminishes the other half in a manner that's perhaps more subtle but nonetheless real. Look at the suicide rates of young men in particular. Look at them all over the world, in and out of war, crime and incarceration. Look at your kind, clever and gentle sons, brothers, husbands and lovers and the pressures that can make them become the closed and invulnerable bullies who first bullied them. <coughs> wasted potential, lost happiness, wasted life. I don't want to call the glass half empty, but the pace of its filling is certainly too slow. Twenty years ago, I thought we were in inevitable positive transition fresh from the comfort and confidence of a completely free and relatively egalitarian state higher education, I had all the time in the world and thought I wouldn't need it. Now I'm not so sure, at least in the short term. I had so much faith in my generation of similarly educated young men and women who shared classes, books and dreams, but grew up to betray each other and themselves with crunched credit, illegal wars, and a more unequal world of our own making. What would a Pankhurst or de Beauvoir make of my generation of feminists? No doubt there would be some cause for celebration, but the festivities would surely be muted. Women vote, fight, and own property and power in many parts of the world. But whether by hook or by crook, an unbowed misogynist took the keys to the White House from a woman who once seemed a near inevitable first female leader of the free world. And within just a year of the election of President Trump came revelations of the multi-decade Harvey Weinstein sexual abuse scandal with its own shockwaves through liberal Hollywood and the much wider world as woman after woman emerged with allegations of historic abuses of power, all denied by the producer. So I'm a lawyer, I can do my own libel reading. All denied by the producer. Um, ranging from cringeworthy, inappropriate advances up to and including rape, the film star Tom Hanks described the phenomenon as a watershed moment, a sea change. He said, his last name will become a noun and a verb. It will become an identifying moniker for a state of being for which there was a before and an after. Prophecy or hyperbole, only time will tell. Sure enough, the scandal inspired a raft of painful testimony from past victims of abuse, much under the hashtag MeToo. This went well beyond the entertainment industry and even crossed the Atlantic from the infamous casting couch to the corridors of British political power. 
Yet, if Hanks before was a world of fearful silence by victims and complicity by the colleagues of the mighty, the only satisfactory after would involve a new atmosphere in every aspect of life. More open and equal cultures would leave power more accountable and engender trust in due process to deal with abuses in the moment instead of years later in the media with its inevitable imperfections. In the meantime, and in so many places women still learn, earn, influence and govern less and suffer more, whether from the petty but dehumanizing indignities of casual objectification and discrimination, or from the emotional, sexual and physical violence that dulls and even snuffs out so many of their lives too soon. Gender injustice may be the greatest human rights abuse on the planet. It blights first and developing worlds, rich and poor women in the context of health, wealth, education, representation, opportunity and security everywhere. It is no exaggeration to describe it as an apartheid, but not limited to one country or historical period. For this ancient and continuing wrong is millennial in duration and global in reach. Only radical solutions can even scratch its surface. However, the prize is a great one because of the collateral benefits to peace, prosperity, sustainability and general human happiness. All this because we are all interconnected and all men are of women. Too. So, um, so that was a bit from the from the introduction to the to my misery memoir. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> there are uplifting bits occasionally. Um, um, what I then tried to do was, I mean, so, so it's quite an ambitious project, right? I'm going to write a book called Off Women. It's going to be it's going to be about every aspect of life, and it's going to be about every continent on earth. How to how to how to slice it up? And I decided not to to make it like one of those. Um, uh, very important but slightly worthy and dry uh, monitoring reports. Right? I didn't want it to be country, country reporting and telling stories about different countries around the world. So instead, I tried to slice it in terms of different aspects of our lives. And so, um, and so um, the, the first chapter is called Prayer Before Birth. And it's, if you like, the most philosophical, uh, named after the the poem, the, the famous Louis McNeese poem that most of you know. Um, and that's the most philosophical chapter where I, for example, discuss what it is to be a woman. What, it, what, is it, what makes you a woman? And, and yes, I do get into the whole trans woman debate there and we can talk about that, if you like, um, in the discussion part. The next chapter is called Misrepresentation and it is about political and media representation of women. And, and you know, there's a journey here. At one stage, I, as Stuart suggested earlier, I, I sat and I counted the number of women who appeared on those Sunday morning political shows, right? Literally just sat and looked back, you know, at hours and hours of this stuff and just counted the talking heads on those Sunday morning shows and it was a pretty, it was pretty poor. It was pretty poor. Even you, know, even, you know, obviously the anchor men, the, the weather, the, the news, the paper reviewers, big political interview number one, big political interview number two, cultural slots, and so often, most often, are heavily, heavily, heavily weighted against uh, female representation. And I think that's significant. I think that's significant because I became interested in politics and political debate um, as a kid watching, you know, watching the TV, watching shows like Weekend World, far too, way before your time, Stuart, <laughs> in the Jurassic Age. Um, I, I really do think it's important. I, I, I do think you have to see it to be it. Um, it's necessary, not sufficient. That's why having female prime ministers is great, but not great enough by itself. Um, but um, a massive problem. And the problem is, once you start looking at the world that way, once you put those X-ray specs on, um, it's a bit of a curse. 
It's like uh, being a superhero in a, in a Marvel comic. comic. Once you've got the X-ray vision, you've got the duty to act upon it. And that's what I think we, we all have. Um, and I, I look not just at news media, but at, but at movies and, and, and all of the data on the way that when you look at a crowd scene in a movie um, and you're asked how many women were in that crowd, um, people think it's 50% when it's 10%. Because cause the, the norm is the male norm and the woman is other. <laughs> and this is, a, this, is a, this is a problem in, in media and in culture and in history and et cetera, et cetera. I, I also looked at, at political representation. And I, you know, in that introduction, I talk about the 32% figure. But you know, we are on track now as a Labour Party to hit 50%. Um, by, at, at the time of the next general election because we have um, all women shortlists in the most winnable seats. And that is a quota of sort. That is affirmative action. And I'm, look, I'll be honest with you, 20 years ago, I didn't, I didn't buy that. I've been on a journey. And I think in the end, the status quo is not meritocracy. And it's not even democracy. Um, we, are, we are here, well-fed, uh, warm in one of the wealthiest countries on earth. That's a very happy accident of birth. It's not meritocratic. It's a, ve it's a great happy accident of, of, of birth and history. But do not tell me that the state of this world is meritocratic and those that have, have on merit and those that don't um, do not. Which takes me to the next chapter, which is called Wealth and Production. It's sounding like a really worthy p pamphlet now, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so let me wake you up before I send you to sleep with my, with my <coughs> worthy pamphlet. Who said this? Right, pub quiz. Without the, without the beer, but never mind. <laughs> Who said this in 1907? Right? In the United States of America, where capitalism has reached its fullest development, 1% of the population owns 99% of the wealth. Who, who, who said that in, in um, 1907? I'm sorry? No, but any, any more for any more? Who might have said that in 1907? Who wrote that actually in 1907? Okay, you're being shy. I've not, I've not warmed you up sufficiently with my son newspaper jokes. <laughs> Okay, well, that would... I revise Shelley, so it's Keir Hardy, isn't it? It's Keir Hardy, because he's read the book. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, don't, I don't know if you noticed what a SWAT steward is, because I saw there were post-it notes <laughs> <laughs> sticking out of all the... You see, I don't have any post-it notes, but he, you know... Um, it, was, it, was, it was Keir Hardy when he, in, in, his, um, in his book From Serfdom to Socialism. So he wrote that in 1907. Now... Who said this in 2017, right? That's over 100, 110 years later. Who said this? A world where 1% of humanity controls as much wealth as the bottom 99% will never be stable. Come on. Say again? Bernie Sanders? No. Not a good, good, good guess. Any, it wasn't Bernie Sanders, but, and, and you're close. Ish. It, uh, another, good, another good guess. It was actually <coughs> President Obama in his final address, in his final address to the UN General Assembly. Um, I'm feeling radical, so we'll call this my final address. Do you know what I mean? Uh, no, no, no but, no, but it's pretty startling, isn't it? So that's, 100, that's 100 plus, 110 years on, and we've still got this 1%, 99%. Now, why is this important to feminism? Because, in, because generally speaking, women and children are on the bottom of that, of that pyramid, right? Which brings me back to the need for structural change. And my feminism is not just the feminism of let's have more women in boardrooms, though of course I want more women in boardrooms, but what about the people serving at the table, cleaning the table, building the table, scrubbing the floor? What about zero hours contracts? What about exploitation all the way down the supply chain? You know, lovely young women probably attending this university, 
feminists all going to the high street to buy frocks that have been made by little girls wherever. You know, it's, it, it, we've got to look at all of this in a holistic way, it seems to me, and it's very, very economic. Very economic. Not least because women do need services. They need, they need childcare. They need safe public transport. Everybody needs these things, but women, women need them more. I also, in that chapter, look at the way that women's work doesn't count. You know, it's, it's an old... It's hundreds of years women have been arguing for women's work, unpaid work in the home in particular. The cooking, the cleaning, the caring. And these days in this country, now for, for older relatives as well as young children. And it doesn't count towards GB, GDP. And it's not being remunerated. <laughs> just doesn't count. It's not considered economic activity. That is hugely political and we need to do something about it. And you know, I think, and I've been discussing this with our brilliant um, Shadow Business Secretary um, Rebecca Long-Bailey, I think that the rise of the robot is a, is a, is a threat and a huge opportunity. Right? Now why, why is it a threat? Because we're all worried that the robots are going to put everybody out of work. Yeah? It's another industrial revolution. It's in danger of putting loads of people out of work. You know, you know, I already hate the fact that there's, 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 no, you know, there's increasingly no supermarket checkout people, right? Because you can go to a machine and you can, you can do it yourself. And I'm thinking, well, those jobs have gone. Bank tellers, gone. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? However, with this industrial revolution, there is a design flaw. Right? If the robots are coming and they're going to make us all redundant, where's the design flaw? Well, who's going to buy this stuff? If everybody's out of work, who's going to buy the iPhones and the et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that, that exaggerated um, technological revolution creates an opportunity for those of us on the left who want a more equal world to say, right, we need, we need to... Um, make sure that the benefits of this advance are shared more fairly. Otherwise, nobody can buy your stuff. Google, Apple, etc., etc., etc. Nobody can buy your stuff if people are not given some <coughs> means um, of survival, and I would say more than survival, uh, 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 of thriving. And that means we can think about the kind of economy we want. We can invest in the caring economy, for example. We can invest in things that we will always do better than robots. We can invest in mental health provision. We can invest it in education and culture and caring and all of those things and make that argument and let the robots come and let them do the tedious, back-breaking work and let's invest Let's turn this, this new technological revolution to our shared, our shared advantage. I'm going to, if you don't mind, I'm going to move on. And what I was actually saying was we invest in people to do the things that the robots don't do. But, but, thank, but thank you for your intervention. Now, so the next chapter is health and reproduction, of course, right? Because you can't write about this stuff without talking about our bits. Because even though... Um, because the sex is real. Right, the differences are exaggerated, and I had some great fun reading into some of the science, and there's some brilliant young women scientists who actually write plain English and break the stuff that I recommend um, Cordelia Fine in particular and her book Testosterone Rex. Yes, there are, yes, there is sexual difference, of course, but it is hugely exaggerated um, in, and, and gendered, gender being the construct, sex being the, the, the real difference, gender being the construct. And, um, and goodness me, at this, this moment in the 21st century, we are still... We have so far to go when it comes to um, health and reproductive equality. And look, I talk about all sorts of horrible stories from all over the world in relation to period poverty, in relation to um, abjection of women and their bodies and, and blood. 
How do you feel in Loughborough? You're allowed to talk about blood in Loughborough? <laughs> it's, a, it's a university. We, um, look, we, we have these problems all over the world, but goodness me, we have them close to home too. So I talk about Cape Town and I talk about Nepal, but, but goodness me, what about the women of Northern Ireland being let down again and again and again? And, you know, sometimes in life-threatening situations because of the archaic abortion laws in Northern Ireland and being let down by the politics, again, as I intimated in the, in, in the introduction. So huge, huge, um, a huge distance we still have to travel to have basic autonomy over our bodies and our lives at risk as, as a result. Um, the next chapter is called Home, and there are two aspects to this for me. It's home as in physical shelter, because it's a... Because you know, to be homeless or to be in inadequate shelter is terrible for everyone, but of course women and children are particularly vulnerable when they're homeless, whether on the streets of this country or whether in a refugee camp. Inadequate shelter is, is, is a massive uh, feminist issue uh, as, as far as I'm concerned. And, you know, I live in central London. This time of year, it gets dark very early. You walk along the River Thames. If you have the time or you drive along or get a bus along the River Thames and I see these luxury blocks all along the River Thames and I see that there are no lights on because nobody lives there. And in some of these blocks there aren't even bathrooms because they have not been bought as places of shelter, they have been bought as an investment. So a human right and it is a human right. It's a social and economic basic human right. The right to shelter is, is not available to people because, because shelter has been commoditized. And so that's one half of the home chapter. And the other half is what happens inside the home. And again, when you write, you read. And that's the great treat of writing a book. You get to read other people's books and you get to reread things that you read a long time ago, like The Female <laughs> Eunuch by Germaine Greer. And I have to tell you, some of the stuff that she wrote... By the way, she wrote that masterpiece when she was not yet 30 years old. Extraordinary. And, OK, you know, I know that she's a controversial... But you, you academics kind of corpse controversy, don't you? Not like me. <laughs> but, 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 but an amazing thing that she wrote when she was, you know, not yet, not yet 30 years old. And some of the stuff that she wrote about family relationships and love and the, those ties that bind and the isolation that we can force people into in what should be a loving, positive, familial re relationship. I, I recommend um, that you go back to the young Jermaine Greer and the, and the female eunuch. And I think there's so much we can do as society to bolster family and community in the way that we design our communities and invest in them. Things like childcare, things like, things like town planning, Things like making sure that, pe that, that the family is not a prison. It is a, it's, it's a, it's a place of happiness and, 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 and not, a, not a place of isolation for anybody in any relationship or, or family. Next chapter was the good news chapter. And it was called, it's called school. And basically it's, it's education. Because the really, really good news in the last century was how we moved to, in, in the developed world at least, to, to pretty much universal secondary education for, for girls and boys. And why is that so important? Because it has the most amazing effect on people's lives. And for every extra year that a woman spends in education, her life chances just multiply. And that means her economic prospects, that means her political engagement, that means the prospects of any children that she has, and she will have fewer of them. Um, so, you know, uh, and then lots in that chapter about the gendered nature of the curriculum, women getting written out of history, um, the, the STEM issue, which I think is, you know, as someone who didn't go very far in STEM and, and, and did essay subjects and, and all of this and ended up a lawyer, um, I think that if you really want to encourage uh, girls and women to go into STEM, it's not enough just to do recruitment campaigns, girls be engineers or girls be mathematicians. I think the rest of the curriculum needs to address this too. And I talk about the movie and the book Hidden Figures, right? 
Did you see that amazing movie about those amazing black women in America, in sort of pre-civil rights, civil rights struggle America, who were called human computers because they were so good at maths that they put men on the moon. And now they, they put a man on the moon in 1969. Those women were essential to that space program and I had never heard of, I was born in 1969. Why did I never know their story until a couple of years ago? Do you see my point? The only woman scientist that I knew about when I was a smallest child was probably Marie Curie because there was a ladybird book <laughs> that was Marie Curie. So, so, so again, once you put on these spectacles, you can't take them off. And, 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 you, and this has to be mainstreamed across the curriculum. And there's some horrific <laughs> stories of sexism from certain universities, not this one, that appear in, in, in that chapter. The next um, chapter is called Insecurity. I won't, dwell, I won't dwell on it, but you know what I mean. Everywhere. Refugee camps, on the street, public transport, school. The horrific data and stats from all over the world about how insecure women feel in terms of their sexual safety and their physical safety on the, in the home, on the street, all over the world. And then the final chapter is called Faith. Because I wouldn't have necessarily predicted it 20 years ago, but this is a huge ongoing issue at this stage in the 21st century. And of course, there are tensions and fault lines between, um, between uh, most faith communities and, and the kind of progress that we want to make when it comes to, to gender justice. <coughs> now, my view on this is that faith is very important to a lot of people and a lot of women. And that means we can't just walk away as feminists. Right? Whether we are of faith or not, and whichever, however we self-define, we've got to give solidarity to our sisters in every faith community. Now, in the end, they'll have to, they'll have to struggle with, and, and it's, it's complicated, isn't it? Because the great world religions are of a certain vintage, they are going to be patriarchal. But I found feminist traditions alive and well in all the great faith communities. At, right. Campaigns for women to be Pope, you know, and, and feminists in Islam, in Hinduism, etc., etc., etc. And that was that again. That was that was that was quite that was quite heartening. Mary Magdalene's been rehabilitated. All sorts of great stories, right? Um, so, I, and then there's a conclusion where I set out, you know, some of some of what I think needs to happen. But I suppose, you know, the biggest thing is I do really believe in affirmative action now. I do believe in the Q word. Quotas, um, and I th and by the way, it cuts it cuts both ways. I think that primary education in this in this country is too feminised. I think there'd be a lot of head teachers that would really welcome the ability to say we don't have um, we don't have enough male teachers in this primary school. I've got some maternity leaves coming up. I want to go out and hire some men. Now that is not legal at the moment, and I think. You know, where there is a business case and a public policy case like that, wouldn't it be great? Some of these kids could, could see young, male, um, caring, engaged role models. And by the way, the salaries would probably go up as well when you sell them, <laughs> right? Uh, lots, of, um, lots of police chiefs would really be, love to be allowed to go out and hire people from certain communities. But, but equally, I think there are parts of, parts of the world of work where there should be a requirement to have greater representation. And, and Stuart mentions the senior judiciary, and I think that's, that's really important. Um, and it's only, it would only be to the good of the rule of law, it would only be to the good of people's trust in these institutions, as well as improving decision making. So that is the conclusion. Um, I want to leave you with my, with my magic word, my favorite word of the moment. It's an old fashioned word, but it's come back into fashion, and that word is solidarity. Now, why do I love that quaint word so much? A couple of reasons. Firstly, it might be a word primarily of the left, but I think it translates into every, every human civilization and language. I think Christians might call it fellowship, Muslims might call it ummah, African peoples talk of Ubuntu, it's this wonderful concept of us being social creatures. Yes, being amazing individuals, special, different, talented, and so on, but, but ultimately still social creatures. 
and can't we do amazing things when we, when we come together? And th the other reason that I love this, this word that's having its rebirth at the moment is that it describes a future that we can work towards. It, it describes a destination, but it also rather magically gives you the, the means of transport to that destination. So I'm not for the battle of the sexes, I'm for us coming together as women and men and uh, being a little braver and a little more radical about, um, about the next hundred years. And um, the next hundred years starts right now. Thanks for listening. <laughs>